English-language newspaper. Um, he spoke German very well. He did not speak Polish so well. Uh, Madge Roberts says, Menashe Unger became a guest in my house for a few months, the quietest one I ever had. He used to open the door and come to the house so quietly that he often frightened us when we encountered him as he suddenly stood there before us. And just as we got frightened when he suddenly appeared, so did we wonder when he suddenly disappeared, like a ghost. Here we are talking to him, and here he is gone, like a ghost, a wizard. It was rabbinic miracles. He further said that in the Warsaw Literary Union during those years, uh, 1925 or so, many hunger artists, as they were called, used to hang around. But he said, hunger was their master. He would hunger with a holy smile in his big green eyes. His hunger artist colleagues would hunger in anger with shouts. We used to call him Menasha Hunger instead of Menasha Hunger. Uh, Melech Ravitch also tells a story about how the Warsaw Literary Union would organize a mask costume ball every winter. Uh, it was the ball of all balls. They would do this as a fundraiser. The evening would include skits uh, based on the Torah, they would play masks and makeup, and one of the scenes was about Joseph and Potiphar's wife, and they wanted Menashe to play the part of Joseph. It took a long time for him to agree, and so discovering that they had so much trouble filling the role of Joseph, they figured that no one would want to, none of the women in the journalist unit would want to play the role of Potiphar's wife, who has an affair with Joseph, and then to their surprise, tens of women applied for the role in order to act opposite Unger in the role of Joseph. So we have all these photos of women, we're not sure who they are, but here's the guy who pose with them. Apparently he was a bit of a ladies' man at this point in his life. His childhood refugee friend, Hudi Ari, uh, uh, goes on to tell the story that Menashe moved in the 20s to Israel as a pioneer, a member of Gedud HaAvadah, a labor battalion, who worked on a kibbutz and studied with people like Gershom Shalom at the Hebrew University. Uh, he wrote for newspapers. Um, uh, as he had written for newspapers in Warsaw, he began to publish in Israel um, the, the, uh, the Own High, the beginning in 1928. And he began to write a variety of Hebrew and Yiddish works on such subjects as the history of Mei Sharim. In Israel, Menashe met people like Shai Agnam and Chaim Nachman Bialik. And according to Yari, this made a great impression on him, as any of us can imagine, meaning either of those amazing uh, writers would. Um, and uh, Bialik convinced him to stop writing articles and rather devote himself to do research on Hasidism. And this was beginning in the big change in Menashe's career, life, and fortune. Um, that's not the right one. Oh, here we go. In 1934, he moved to the United States. He became a writer for the Tug, or the Day Morning Journal, which was a secular socialist newspaper that even came out on uh, Saturdays and on holidays, except for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Uh, it was more left-wing than the forward, um, but still Zionist, nationalistic, less communist than the Freiheit. And he hung out in Greenwich Village with writers, artists, and liberals in the coffee houses in Greenwich Village. People like Ron Chanikoff, Ben Zion, Zuni Maud. And the way that it would work is they would do a trade. They would give him a, a work of art, a painting, many of which we still have. And he would give them a copy of one of the books that he was writing. They all were people who came from Orthodox and Hasidic backgrounds and had kind of given it up to become the intelligentsia of Greenwich Village. And it was also there in Greenwich Village that he met and married a young artist named Ruth Unger, um, or Our Bubi. Um, so we'll tell you just a bit about her. She was born in Lunch in Poland, which is near Warsaw. She was the second child of seven or maybe eight kids, and she didn't know her actual birth date. She used to use March 15th, the eyes of March, as her birth date, I think kind of cynically. Um, and she, but you know, she was born in 1906. Now, she told me when, when I was young that lunch had a lot of culture. There was Jewish and Polish theater, and then most of the Polish Jews in lunch were pretty assimilated and actually didn't speak a whole lot of Yiddish. Um, they thought of that as the language of kind of the uneducated shell Jews. And her family was pretty well off. They had a big apartment with a telephone and with two maids. Um, now, and she would say that the poorest Jews lived in the shell, um, the rich get richer and the poor have children. Um, 
her mother over here, Rachel Kalish, um, was like for our grandfather the more observant of the two, but also she was the businesswoman in the family. And uh, according to my grandmother, everyone was afraid of her. Uh, after World War I, she borrowed money and bought out bankrupt businesses, especially Cork from Portugal. Um, now, Cork was kind of a much more significant thing in those days before there was plastic and Tupperware. Her father, on the other side, was the foreman of his family's cork factory, not as religious as his wife. He was Russian um, and the oldest child of five, um, and not as much of a businessman as her, and much more of like an artist and a dreamer. Um, my mom always said that he would rather be an artist than a businessman, and so here's an example of one of the carvings that he made out of cork that we still have today. Um, sometime after the First World War, the whole family moved first to Palestine and then later to Melbourne, Australia. Um, Ruth, my grandmother, traveled to Paris, London, and San Francisco to study art, and then she finally moved to New York City, where she was part of that same scene of intelligentsia of Greenwich Village, where she met Menashe. So Menashe and Ruth lived together in Greenwich Village in a five-story walk-up. And Menashe at the time, in Greenwich Village, was writing for the Yiddish newspaper, Der Tag. Uh, and he became a very important part of that newspaper. Um, one of his features was kind in the Yiddish Geschichte, what happened today in Jewish history. He also wrote a question about, uh, like, much like uh, his father did, he answered questions, but from a less religious point of view. Um, he wrote under several set pen names, as is not uncommon for people trying to make a living, because you can't have your name be on every article, uh, so you have to come up with pen names. So he had pen names like Mem of Ger, which is just a contraction of Menashe Unger, and uh, Tarnoff, the city that he grew up in. But he especially wrote about Hasidism. His very good friend, B.C. Goldberg, said that Menashe Unger's articles on Hasidism didn't make fun or glorify. He didn't satirize Hasidism or make it exotic. He humanized Hasidism. And because he went directly and deeply into the human aspect of Hasidism, he brought it to a higher level. Menashe Unger's articles were read by religious and secular, Hasidic, not Hasidic, the Misnagdim. Everyone found something new for themselves, a social aspect, a bit of Torah, a new light, a story about a rabbi in a deeper sense, and mainly because it was written honestly from the heart. As he said, that which comes from the heart goes directly into the heart. Uh, in December of 1942, when Menashe was 43 years old, Ruth gave birth to a baby girl, Yehudi Menucha, or called in English Judy, that's her mom. And this is a congratulatory telegram from uh, Der Tug. And um, here's the posting in Der Tug with the birth announcement, seven pounds, two ounces. Uh, they were delighted by their new daughter, but they couldn't stay in their tiny five-story walk-up in Greenwich Village. So they moved to 3165 Decatur Avenue in the Bronx, where they stayed until the 1960s. That's the very last stop on the D train. It took my dad two and a half hours to get there from where he grew up in Coney Island when he went visiting my mom when they were dating. Uh, my mom recalls that in the Bronx in that neighborhood, the private houses were owned by um, the Irish, and the Jews lived in the apartment houses. This is the house. Um, in talking about her dad, she said that it was just unconditional love. He'd come home from work, dead tired from schlepping home from East Broadway after a long trip on the subway. But as soon as he came in, they would play together with blocks on the living room floor. Um, and she said that he couldn't just build something with him out of blocks. It had to be educational. You had to build a school or a hospital. Um, <laughs> He would make up bedtime stories, and then he ended up publishing some of them in Yiddish, and some of them got translated to English. Um, she was raised as a, a cultural, secular Jew, a family that celebrated Purim and Hanukkah and Pesach, and she went to like a secular Yiddish after shul uh, and, and um, uh, Yiddish summer camps. In addition to writing, Menashe began to travel. He went to Mexico, Canada, Argentina, Chile, among other places to uh, speak to Yiddish-speaking communities there. I actually have a uh, silver cup from Mexico that was given to him in honor of his speaking there one time. Menasha was an amazing person with people. He could talk to anyone, he made friends instantly, and they ended up being lifelong friends. Uh, 
He had really two groups of friends. First was the intelligentsia, the people that he spoke with and debated with, and then there were the patron mer merchant types who helped him pay for books. Uh, at that time, publishing books in America was not particularly simple, especially Jewish books. They often had to be self-published. But he had this range of friends who were willing to take on the responsibilities of, of, of helping him publish the books, of distributing the books, of reporting the sales, and so on. And wherever he went, he uh, gained trust and friendship with the people he met city to city and across the world. Um, so he always had this Yiddish accent, which apparently he kept on purpose because it was good for business. Um, and my mom hated it because it made him sound like a refugee. Uh, like you heard before, he would collect these nigunim, um, and he would sit around with his friends around the uh, apartment, and they would sing together. Right? It's the way they'd like, might get together and have a jam session, uh, singing folk songs in English. They would get together and they'd sing Hasidic melodies and uh, Yiddish worker songs. <coughs> Um, a story that my dad tells that I absolutely love is that he would tell a joke in English and then he would tell the punchline in Yiddish in, in order to encourage my father to learn more Yiddish. So my mom would have to translate the punchline, but there would always be some sort of untranslatable punchline that didn't make any sense when you translated it into English. If you want during the QA, I'll give you an example of one. No, 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 he never talked about the Holocaust. He never talked about his family growing up. Um, so our mom doesn't know as many of the stories as we learn by getting things translated by his, from his own contemporaries. Um, but we do know that he worked hard with uh, Schulte uh, to get people out of camps into America. And he was very involved both before and after the war on, on issues of refugees. He did go back to Poland two times to visit the graves of his parents, but he never said anything else about the trip. Um, my mom described him as very hugging and kissy, but in a very cosmopolitan Viennese sort of way. And what he would do is when she brought her boyfriends over, uh, he would hug and kiss them to see if they would hug him back. And if he did, then he liked them. And so my father, who's pictured here with my mom, uh, he passed the test. Here he is with Saul uh, in 1967. Um, at the time, he he didn't really ever go to show. Uh, he wasn't a synagogue goer, but he always found some reason to set foot in a show, although it wasn't for a prank. It was to check out a, an unusual synagogue, a Chinese or a black synagogue, to uh, something that he was writing on a column, or to compare high holiday services. Uh, one thing we know well is that he loved Passover and loved uh, the Seder. And the way he gathered is a collective group of people around the table, his close friends and anyone who felt good. He had a collection of Haggadot from all over the world in different languages. And he ran an abbreviated Seder, but the Seder would be in whatever language the next person who was reading was doing it in, without regard for anybody else knowing what was going on. Um, and they all generally did know what was going on. Some of the people we know that were around the Seder table were his very good friends who, who remain people in our lives uh, much later. Saul and Edith Tao, uh, his very good friend B.C. Goldberg, who was the son-in-law of Shalom Alechem, uh, Bell Kaufman, who was Shalom Alechem's niece, and um, Ellie Wiesel. Um, so they all together celebrated with him. He uh, died on the 21st of Tammuz, 5729. Um, which was July 7th, 1969, at the age of 69. And uh, here's baby Mark Kaiserman, who was born in 1970 and is named after him. His Hebrew name is Rinasha Umber Kaiserman. Um, we'll say just a couple closing words about our grandfather. Um, you know, years later, uh, in like the late 80s and in the 90s, when I was you know, uh, a young man, let's say, our cousin Gietel, who we told you about before, would take me around to the Borough Park to meet like the Hasidic family. She'd take me dancing on some hot Torah. Um, and and uh, everyone that I'd meet would say, oh, you're an Einigol from Menashe Unger. You're his grandson. He was such a nice man. He was such a good guy. And I really kind of it was very meaningful to me that that was the first thing that they said about him, was how nice, how kind he was. And it, it really, I walked away from that experience saying, you know, that's how I want to be remembered. I would love it if after I go, people would say that about me, that I'm a nice, 
nice man, but that would be the first thing that would come to their mind. Every time I look at my sneak on my rabbinic ordination or I'm called to the Torah, I'm called with the same name that, that he was called with. And it just gives me such honor and privilege to know that I can help carry on the legacy of love and life and friendship and Judaism and family that he carried on. I never had the privilege to meet him, but I feel like I know him oh so well. And I'm ever grateful to my brother who put all of this together for helping me learn so much more about my grandfather and, and connect even greater to him. So we'll say thank you to uh, all the folks who helped translate the documents from Yiddish for us, um, and, and to my dad who collected all of these uh, photos and, and uh, digitized them, and to Gadi and all the folks at the Skirball Center for organizing this event. And now we want to uh, invite Jonathan Boyard to read the book, the book to us a little bit from the work, and we'll do some Q&A.